Welcome back to the course on measure theory for probabilists. We now introduce set systems, semi rings, string, sigma algebras, thinking systems, compact systems for the last um, video. And today we want to apply this and really understand or introduce first functions on these set systems, which I will call set functions, which um, take some set and apply some non-negative real number to it. You might want to call this a volume of the set or maybe a probability of the set. Um, that doesn't matter, it's just the value of the function um, on the set. And there will be different such functions with different properties which we'll have in this video. Um, above all, we will have um, measures we will also have outer measures. Um, the notion may be a bit strange because a measure will be defined on a sigma field and the outer measure is not just a special measure, it's something more general actually. Um, it's defined on um, the set of all sets, so the power set. But these two measures and outer measures will have different properties and we will come to this, maybe not this video, but um, in the next video. So let's first introduce measures and all these properties that we will need. So set functions and outer measures. Um, as I already said, so F is some set system and a map which maps this F to non-negative reals, maybe infinity, um, is a set function. Okay. And now to the first point. A mu is additive, maybe I'll call this also finitely additive, if mu of the disjoint union, so this here stands, um, please recall this for the AKs are sets and they're disjoint and I make the union of all these. Mu of this disjoint union is the sum of the mu's. So, well, if I have an A1 here and an A2 here, then um, A1 disjoint union U2 is, yeah, just the union of these two. And the volume, if you want to call me the volume of the union of these sets, that's just the sum, sum of these two volumes. That, that's the interpretation. There's one very important formal thing I'd like to stress here. So I'm writing mu of something here. So that's the something here and the something here. And on the slides, I will always assume that mu is actually defined in a way such that this here is in this F here. Otherwise, mu of this here wouldn't even be defined. So when I write this, I impl implicitly assume that this is defined. Okay. So that's finite additivity. I also have sigma additivity. That's the same when this here holds for the upper limit here being infinity. Then if F is a sigma algebra and the mu here is sigma additive, mu is also called a measure and the triple omega F mu. So state space, sigma algebra, set function is a measure space. We call a measurable space was the, p the pair of the first two here. And a measure space also includes the mu here then. Okay, and with respect to probability theory, um, mu of something which, will, which we, will be a probability, we'll call this a probability here. And the probability of the whole space will always be one. And the property here, mu of omega is one, mu is a probability measure. And the triple here is then called a probability space. That's what we will need later in probability theory. Then we had additivity. We also have subadditivity. Here I do not have the disjoint union, just any union, but mu of the union is smaller or equal to the sum. So here the similar picture as before would be something like this, A1, a2, they have a non-empty intersection. 
And the union is this here, so the volume of the union is in this case probably smaller, and here in general smaller or equal, to the sum of the volumes of the two sets. Again, the same might hold. Um, if n is infinity, then I call this sigma subadditive. Then I will need mu is monotone. Well, that's also something easy to draw if this is A here and B is a superset. Then the volume of A should be smaller than the volume of B, which means that the mu here is monotone. And then I can already define what a, an outer measure is. That's mu star here usually. It's defined on the power set. It has uh, three properties. Sigma subadditive, monotone, and mu star of zero is zero. So mu star of empty set is zero. That's called an outer measure. As you see here, it's not required that the outer measure is additive or sigma additive. It's just sigma subadditive. Also, um, it is defined on the power set. And what we also will need, um, a set is called mu star measurable, um, if this here holds. Let's just leave that for the moment. We will come back to this probably in one of the next videos. And let me also mention that these outer measures were probably most studied by someone called Kara Theodori. And in one of the next videos, we will have then also Kara Theodori's theorem. Let me briefly mention what this is or part of it is that the set of measurable sets, these are probably or mostly not all of them, but they again form a sigma algebra. And when you take the sigma algebra, you can define a measure from the outer measure. That's how we will construct a measure on a sigma algebra. But before we come to this, we have to deal with some more things connecting the properties that we had. In particular, additivity, sigma additivity, uh, subadditivity, monotonicity, and so on. And there is something more we will need. Um, these so-called leftovers from definition 2.1. So first we had finite measures. That was a finite measure was one where mu of omega is smaller than infinity. Sigma finite measures are also exist. That's the case where, well, omega I can write as a union of omega n's and mu is finite all on, on all omega n. So mu of omega n is smaller than infinity. We will need this sometimes. We will also need inner regularity. In particular, k will here be the set of, uh, will be a compact system in the application, but I can define this here for a more general set system. So k is a set system. Mu is defined on f. Um, and k in this case must be a subset of f. And if it holds that, well, if I have, if I have an a here, so that's the a um, in f, and I can approximate this A here from inside by some case in K such that um, yeah, the soup of mu of K of all these inner things here equals mu of A. Then I say that mu is inner K regular. Yeah, and K will be, for example, uh, complex sets and A will be general measurable sets. Um, and something which we will also need later, the support of a measure. So there is a biggest closed, no, sorry, the smallest closed set uh, with mu of the complement of F is zero, it's called the support. So outside of F, outside of F, so that's here all outside of F, 
mu assigns volume or probability zero. Um, and you want to be the outside of f as large as possible, such that f should be as small as possible. So f is the set where there is volume or probability or something, mu volume, mu probability, and so on. That's the support of mu. Some examples. As I told you, I assume that you already heard about some probability distributions. And yeah, let me just connect the notion of a measure with the distributions that you already know. And let me mention a distribution is a measure and a measure is a distribution. So measure and distribution, these are synonyms. Um, but let me start at the top here. So H is the set of all half open intervals. And I can define mu of a b is b minus a. That's an additive sigma finite set function. Yeah, you can make up your mind why that might be the case. Another measure, even a probability measure, is the following. Delta omega prime, that's, well, I call this also the point mass on omega prime. So omega prime gets probability one and everything else gets probability zero. So if A contains omega prime, then you have one, otherwise, yeah, the probability is zero. So this here is the value. That's a probability measure I claim here. Um, yeah. Another thing is when you have measures, you can also sum them and that will stay a measure. Um, if you have just, if you sum over these point masses, I call this a counting measure because you're counting how many of these omega i's here are in the set A that you have. Then what we will need for the distributions which you already know, the sum of a i mu i and a i are non-negative real numbers. Let's also measure. And by this you can, for example, define, well, let's start with the Poisson distribution. You might recall this formula here, e to the minus gamma, gamma to the k divided by k factorial. Maybe you didn't write gamma, but lambda or alpha or beta or something. But that's just the name of the parameter. And this here is some ai here. And the mu i here, here, that's um, the point mass on k. And by this, I can write down the Poisson distribution. Yeah. Similarly, the geometric distribution, I just have other um, weights, I call these. One is uh, so the geometric distribution was the distribution of the time of first success if I have a success probability of p in a random experiment. So first I have k minus one not successful attempts and one then one successful attempt here. And this here the geometric distribution. And the last one here, you might also recall this here, um, that's the binomial distribution. So these are the, the binomial weights. So it's a binomial weight on K. You also know this, I guess. Um, well, let's come to some lemmas connecting our things. First of all, well, that's not really a lemma about measures, but we have to, we need this in, in, the, in the next um, result. Yeah, a semi-ring. Recall that for a semi-ring, if A is in the semi-ring and B is in the semi-ring, that one requirement was that I can write um, A without B as a disjoint union of CIs. And here the claim is that I can then also write A um, without the union of AIs as a disjoint union. So that's a more general thing. So 
if this here is just the B from above, that's clear. Um, and otherwise it's not immediately clear. Proof is by induction on n. And we just said n equals 1. That's okay because it's just here a without a1. And we'll call a1 here b. And you just have it write a without a1 as a disjoint union. That's just a requirement for the same union. Um, then induction step. So I can already write induction step. I can write a without the union i from 1 to n a i as the disjoint union of bj's. I can also write uh, bj without a n plus 1, since I have a semi-ring as a disjoint union of c, c, k, j's, where I make the union over all k's. And then, when I have this, I can write a without the union 1 from n to n plus 1 a i. Yeah, what is this? I can write this as one uh, a without the union up to n. And so that's not correct, but set minus a n plus one. So in this set here, I have everything which is in a, which is not in the union from a one to a n, and also not in a n plus one. So that's essentially yeah, that's. It, Effectively, exactly this here, but now I can use what I already have and uh, make inductions. So I can write this here as uh, disjoint union BJ's uh, without a n plus one, which is when I use this trick here. Um, disjoint union over all j's, disjoint union over all k's, c, k, j, which means I can write this here um, as a disjoint union over all sets in the semi-ring and I'm done. And I will need this now. Um, so that's a very important lemma. Again, I have a semi-ring. I have an additive function on a semi-ring. Then M is monotone and subadditive. Let me just recall this example here. So this here um, is an example of an additive set function on a semi-ring. And for this, I mean, that's just uh, um, the very basic thing, which as you might know, leads to the so-called Lebesgue measure on R. And we now prove that this here is monotone and subadditive. And on the next slide, we'll also have it's sigma additive if it and only if it's subadditive. So monotonicity, um, oops, monotonicity. Yeah, so let's take A, a subset of B, and B without A, I can write as a disjoint union over CJs. And then I can write mu of A is apparently smaller or equal than mu of A plus the sum over mu of CJ because mu of cj, that's all non-negative numbers. And the point is that from this here, I can write b as a disjoint union of a and all the cj's. And I know that mu is additive. And additivity means if I have something, we will have sets 
which are disjoint, then mu of the union equals the sum of uh, the mu's. So this here is mu of b, because that's just the union. And that already gives me monotonicity. Then, next thing which I will need, um, that's an extension of this monotonicity. If I have that the disjoint union of AI is, is a subset of A, then um, the sum of a mu of AIs is smaller or equal than the, than the mu of A. That's not the same thing as above. Uh, yeah, but basically it is. Basically it is. Because uh, this here is nothing but mu of the disjoint union of AIs by definition. Ah, wait a moment, wait a moment. No, that's not true. I mean, it is true, of course, but um, recall that I said that I'm always assuming if I write something like this here, I assume that um, this here is in the semi-ring and that doesn't have to be in the semi-ring. So careful. So that's not so easy. I want this to be true, although I have the possibility that um, this set is not element of the semi-ring. I need this. Um, yeah. And for this, I first write A without the disjoint union of AIs. I can write this as a disjoint union of BJs. That's the lemma we had here. Yeah, I can do this. Um, and then I can start writing mu of A. Uh, yeah, now I can say A is the disjoint union of these here and these here. So this is uh, mu of disjoint union A of I's, disjoint union BJ's. Then I can use additivity because all of these here and all of these here are elements of the semi-ring. So the sum of mu of AI plus mu of BJ's. And well, that's apparently bigger or equal than sum over mu of AIs. And that was the claim. That this year is more equal than this year. Okay. And last, I need sub additive. So that was a um, work we had to do in order to show now sub additivity. Um, So we have to show that mu of a union is more equal than sum of the mu's. Um, mu of a union of AIs, and now these AIs don't have to be disjoint. It's more equal than mu, sum mu of AI. How do we do this? We write mu of the union of AIs. Well, and now here's some trick. Um, I can write, for example, mu of A1, disjoint union, A2 without A1. Disjoint union, well, now I have everything in A1 and A2. A3 without A1 and A2 and so on. And when it say and so on, I could also write it like this here. Um, disjoint union. 
um, AI without union J from one to I minus one A J like this here. Then again, this here, I can write by this lemma here as another disjoint union of CKJs and use additivity such that I have uh, I and K's mu of C K I's uh, yeah and what is C K I so the union of all these K's here is a one without the rest. So let me write this down. So I write this here as a disjoint union over C K I's. So we're all K. And apparently this here is a subset of AI. Um, and I have essentially something like this here. I have the disjoint union here of the CKI, so the subset of AI, and then mu of the sum of the mu's is more equal than mu of A, which means that this here is smaller or equal than sum over i mu of ai from what we had before and i have proved this here so the second part of lemma 2.5 here we want to show that sigma additivity and sigma sub additivity is actually the same thing with these prerequisites and one part we almost had already, because we showed from additive, um, it follows that subadditivity. And well, that means from sigma additivity to sigma subadditivity, um, that's just the same thing as before. Sorry, my handwriting is not the very best. For n equals infinity. But the other way round. So, uh, sorry. The other way round. We have to prove that if mu is sigma subadditive, it's also sigma additive. Um, so, this is this direction. And we have some A, which is the disjoint union of AIs. And this is also in H, because otherwise we cannot really write down what we want to have. Um, first of all, we have that uh, the sum of mu of IA, um, I from one to N, is smaller or equal than mu of a. Why is that? Um, the disjoint union of a i, a from 1 to n, with this definition here, is a subset of a. And we showed here in this claim, if this here holds, then the sum is smaller or equal to mu of a. So that's what we already have. And now we can write as follows sum i from 1 to infinity mu of a i is the sub of all n sum i from 1 to n mu of a i this is well this here is smaller than mu of a so the sub over all n is also smaller or equal than mu of a and mu of a is smaller or equal than the sum i from 1 to infinity mu of a i because um, 
A is the union of the AIs and subadditivity holds, which is mu of the union is more equal than sum of the mu's. And now we look at this. This here is the same as this. We have all smaller equals, more equal. That means all of these four things are the same. In particular, um, yeah, mu of the disjoint union equals sum of mu of ai, and this is exactly sigma additivity as we want to have it. Okay, so that was the hardest part of today. Now I have two more things, one which is not so hard and the other one which you might be also, uh, which you might also already know. So first, so we argued with semi-rings at the moment, but there are also rings and we already have the ring generated by the semi-ring. Um, where did we have this? I think we had this in the third generated ring. Here we have it here. So that's the ring generated by some set system. Um, and here we had the ring generated by a semi-ring is the disjoint union of all members of the semi-ring. And assume we have a set function on a semi-ring. And here I claim we can extend this to the ring generated by the semi-ring by saying, well, what members are in the ring generated by the semi-ring, which are not yet in the ring itself? Well, just the disjoint unions of members of the semi-ring. And on these, I just define my set function as sum of mu ai. And that's the only way you can extend mu which is defined on the semi-ring to a set function on the generated ring that coincides with mu on h. Uh, and one important thing, of course, that's the only way to have an extension which is, which is still additive. Well, basically that's almost clear. So everything is clear that's additive because this formula is just uh, additive. The only thing we have to prove is uh, that mu tilde is well defined. That means it might be that this set here can be written also differently as a disjoint union of bj's or something, and then the same result um, comes out here. That's not immediately clear. So let the disjoint union of AIs be the same as the disjoint union of BJs. And we have to prove that the sum of these mu of AI is the sum of the mu of BJs. So mu of AI, I claim I can write it as follows. That's the sum of I and, no, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, sum over all i. Then here I really have the sum of all i and j. Mu of a i intersection with b j. This is the case because a i I can write as the disjoint union of a i intersection with b j. That should be clear. And on the other hand, I can also write bj as the disjoint union of uh, ah sorry I have to really say here so that's the sum of j's you know i's bj in the section a i like this here so that's clear now because I had, can write down this here as a disjoint union of these and I have additivity. Um, the order of summation doesn't really matter, which means 
I can use the same argument um, in the other direction and have that's the same as mu of bj because bj is this disjoint union here. And when I sum over the i's here, I come to mu of bj, which means that this here and this here is the same, which means that the mu tilde here is well defined. So proof is done. And now the last thing, the so-called inclusion-exclusion principle. This formula here looks a bit complicated, but this here, that looks familiar. And even more familiar is this drawing here. So that's a set A1 and that's a set A2. And I want to compute the content or probability of A1 union A2. And the formula goes, I have to take mu of A1 plus mu of A2, and then subtract, watch, which I added twice, which is A1 intersection A2. Well, um, and for this, I need an additive set function on a ring. Yeah, or it's just a semi-ring, but everything which is written down here so this here doesn't really have to be in the semi-ring, but if it's also in the same ring, it also holds. And the reason is as follows. I can write A1 union A2 as A1 disjoint union A2 without A1. Um, so, yeah, I can write A1 intersection A2 disjoint union with A2 without A1. Well, what is this? So these are all in A2, which are also in A1, and these here are all in A2, which are not in A1. So apparently that's here A2. I can use additivity of the sect function and have uh, mu of a2 equals this here plus this here. So mu of a2 equals mu of a1 intersection a2 plus mu of a2 without a1. But I also have that this here is so mu of a1 union a2 as mu of a1 plus mu of a2 minus a1, which means I can solve for this here and have a mu of a1 intersection a2 plus mu of a1 union a2 minus mu of a1. And when you look at this, uh, this here on the other side, this here on the other side, that's exactly this formula here. So that's the proof for i equals 2, and if it becomes more complicated, well, that's just more complicated. Just draw one picture for three U sets, a1, a2, a3. You want to compute the volume of the union. You compute a mu of a1 plus mu of a2 plus mu of a3. Apparently, you computed something double, for example, the intersection of a1 and a2, you counted double, so you so you'd subtract it. You subtract the intersection of a1 and a2, you subtract the intersection of a1 and a3, and the intersection of a2 and a3. And then you look at the intersection of all three of them, and you see, well, you added them three times, you subtracted it three times, so you have to add it again in order to count it once. And continuing like this, you get this formula here, which you can have a look at. Okay, great. Then we are done for today. And in the next video, we will um, continue with outer measures. See you then.